Hey everyone, welcome back to Summoner Scuffle. Um, first order of business is Fuzzy. How do I pronounce this person on the left? Their name. Everyone wants to say Psych. It is not Psych. I always it have is... said Psych. <laughs> no, no, it is short for Physical Science. So we're gonna train ourselves to say Physca or something like that. Physca. It's probably just gonna become Fizz by the end of the stream. Just because physica, I, I can't do it. But we're gonna try. It is physical, sorry, physical chemistry. Physical chemistry. I Otherwise, see. physical science doesn't even make sense. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> physica, obviously, from Hergrada in chat. So I think he's gonna be physical chemistry or fizz for me, because the k just feels like something from a foreign language that, you, you know, like, <laughs> like Spanish R's or something that or you know, <laughs> the, like COSA, the click, the African clicking language. I can't do it. Yeah. Um, COSA. I just see I can't. So we'll troll. We'll try. We're not going <laughs> to we're, we're not going to listen to two hours of me trying to do African clicking language. <laughs> um, yeah. And so and, but anyway, and how would you and, how would with, you introduce same, them? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, same with the Shrike. I'm not going to try and pronounce the mispronunciation. So this is going to be fun because um, Fizka is one of the old timers here. He is famous for writing the Cave Goblins Guide, which I throw at new people on the Discord whenever someone is like, I, I can't win at this game. You know, tell me what faction I should play, what I should do. My answer is generally, you know, try Cave Goblins read Fizka's Cave Goblins Guide and just play in a paint-by-numbers way. Now, when he plays Cave Goblins, it's not paint-by-numbers. You know, he's not always going to follow his guide because there's variations with card draw, there's, you know, variations with who the opponent is and what they're doing. So he's got a lot more in his arsenal than what's in the guide. But I really love the guide for just giving it to someone and it's an unambiguous how to, this is how the faction wants to be played, just follow the guide until you're comfortable and then move on to, you know, other strats with this faction or other factions. So that's, that's kind of Fiska's claim to fame in Summoner Wars, although he's very good with other factions too. I mean, Wayfarers kind of play similarly sometimes. He loves playing high elves in a similarly aggressive way just charging up field so there's he's definitely not a one-trick pony but that's what he's known for and i did the somewhat mean thing of throwing him at the shrike who is a much newer player here um but the shrike earned my respect when they came on and you know was just like you know what, um, you know, Gary Kasparov once said the best way to learn is by losing to the best player you can for as long as you can stand it. <laughs> so that always stuck in my mind. And, you know, I've messaged with the Shrike a little bit. And, you know, I think what they want out of this game is geeky analysis. So we're going to give them that definitely in the conversation afterwards. And also, don't sleep on them, because what the Shrike has done is really specialized in Sky Spear Avians. So I know he comes from a chess background, and that he's very good with the birds. So this is a little bit of me matchmaking old blood versus new blood. Let's see what happens. Let's see the feathers fly. Um, but I wouldn't do this to a new player unless I knew that was what they wanted, you know, that I knew, I knew that this was the challenge they're after. Um, hopefully on the scuffle, we're going to see more new players. I've asked some people from Division 4, Division 5 in League, and I think people somehow feel the pressure to play at this Vexor versus Profit level, you know, because that's who we'd opened with. And my view has always been, let's just play this game. We're showing off what people do. You know, last week we did the lore version where we just talked, you know, how do these factions on the board tell a story? You know, what's, what's the story of this game? So there's so many ways we can enjoy this game other than all try to be Vexor versus Profit. So that's my spiel on the players. Let's talk factions in about the five minutes we have. <laughs> yeah, well, wow, you've you've gotten me hyped for this match. There's so much, so much background. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see 
they're they're avians i i feel like it's the sorry I, talking about factions i feel like that is the best mindset to just be like let me lose to the let me lose to the best players but um sometimes sometimes just it's lose. tough to lose over <laughs> and over again <laughs> you know this up i set this up as let me lose but i'm itching for an upset <laughs> You know, like yeah, I kind of yeah, set yeah. this up to have my cake and eat it too. You know, like if you know wh whether David or Goliath wins, it's going to be a fun show. Yeah, uh, yeah. So factions, and I'll say real quick, I'm also sick, so if I sound weird, I ap apologize for that. But let's talk about cave goblins, who are top tier again. Why would you need to play anyone else when you can play the cave <laughs> goblins? Um, it seems like their their stick is pretty easy to grasp you like three of your four commons cost zero um and so just play as many of them as you can and overwhelm the board and um you have a lot of events that combo with your zero cost units and just try to overcrowd your opponent and destroy them uh is is the is, is the is the quick and dirty um how would you how would you go into more specifics with that, Fuzzy? More quick and more dirty. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. these guys are not complex. I mean, it does take a lot of skill to play them well. You know, it takes skill to play them with the enormous reach they have. Um, because, you know, their ranged unit is kind of weak. They, you know, those those um slingers only hit for two. But there's a gazillion of them. They get extra attacks. The Beast Riders can move in for four. The Clingers can get taken strange places by the Climbers. So really the hallmark of this game is quick, dirty reach. They will get to corners of the board that you didn't think were possible. And there's the sneak event as well, which is useful for either moving someone in front of your gate where you don't want them, um, for moving a Clinger within range of hitching a ride, um, all sorts of wonderful and awful uses for sneak so yeah. that's my spiel about um cave goblin reach cave goblin tempo yeah. and just cave goblin pain well one thing to note about the cave goblin reach is that it somehow does feel more fair than the other two um cunning decks which are vlocks and wayfarers vlocks <laughs> and wayfarers I, I can i can both define as like they have abilities that feel like teleportation like the Wayfarers, you can you can um, you still have slip by to just go to a diagonal spot, which just feels like oh, I'm just gonna jump here, and you couldn't have predicted that. And then Vlox can like just teleport a unit behind you and blah blah blah. But Sneaks, uh, if you set up against him with just a line of units, he's not gonna teleport back. Like if your summoner is surrounded by multiple units, unless those units die, you're safe. Um, and so in that sense, That's true. he's fair. <laughs> um, well, it, Sneaks is the one who can teleport. That is true. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> and then, and, and then uh, some of the like best events in the game with just like Enrage the Horde to get extra attacks, unrelenting, your opponent doesn't get magic, and you get the unit back when a unit's destroyed. Um, but let me move on to the Avians. So many decks here. Um, and... Ava is awesome. I, f I feel like we don't talk about Ava that much. I, I, I don't know why in the Discord. And she's just, she's maybe one of the most unique decks to, to come out. And that, that all comes from her ability Flight um, and Take to the Skies uh, to just give all of her commons flight. So you just, you have the movement advantage always. And so the game becomes, how do I take advantage of the fact that I can move three th three spaces and through cards with usually pretty much every unit that I have? Um, and that can, a lot of times that comes down to, I'm gonna set up in the back and sort of, and keep away and snipe, or, and then I'm gonna jump on you all of a sudden um, and, some players play more aggressively, just running straight up with airy divers. Um, it's just movement, 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 is what I'd say. You know, to what you said about cave goblins earlier, what I really like about the birds is that it's honest movement. You're not getting hit by teleportation, like you said. You're not getting hit by, you know, an out of shadows turn. But you know those birds can move three spaces and through units so it's still painful to anticipate what they're going to do but it's not the same like 
feeling of just, you know, how did they get from point A to point B that sometimes happens with, like you said, wayfarers and cloaks, where you're just surrounded out of nowhere. You know, avians, you're surrounded out of somewhere. You know, avians, you know how they got there, and now you just have to deal with them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and like, and their movement's really strong, and you're like, all right, if they, if they ever... Like you always just look at every bird on the field and you're like, if the, if ever a bird can get behind my summoner, I will probably lose the game. <laughs> so I just need to <laughs> stop that from happening at whatever, whatever possible cost. Um, but well, like you said, it's sort of, it's sort of fair other than the divers. Like you also need to think about a diver can come in anywhere around Aver and then move three spaces. And that, I mean, I've definitely lost a handful of games to forgetting about that. Um, They'll be interesting in this matchup because they are the avians' only way of dealing direct damage and sneaking and getting around the three attacks per turn, which is definitely something you want against cave goblins. Yeah, you know, yeah. With their swarm of weak little units. You want some way to kill an extra one of them. Yeah, we should probably get started soon, but I, I would even predict that Ava wouldn't struggle a bit in this matchup this is i'm coming up with this on the fly but just the the fact that that's your only way to ping a unit um to like get extra attacks like other than that you're doing three attacks period and that just often isn't enough to deal with the goblins um but we'll see we'll see tricky one because on the other hand ava can get herself out of harm's way pretty quickly you know ava can get herself out of this goblin horde advance um but Sneaks can slide in, so she, if she wants to Sky Salt, Battle Song, try and get nine dice on, on Sneaks, she'd better actually get the kill. You know, otherwise he's just going to teleport to the other side of the board and you have to chase him down. So it's, it's going to be interesting, but I do think if I were picking a side of the matchup to play, I think I would pick Cave Goblins, to be honest. I would feel quite a bit more comfortable playing the cave goblin side and maybe that is just me and my comfort level with each faction yeah yeah it's interesting i think we got we got the game link. we got a link we got a link uh one second while i pull that up yep. um it's, it's it's interesting yeah to point out that it it is it is two summoners that you feel like can just teleport away like it's the two summoners that you can't really assassinate because they can pretty much always escape um so they they have they have that going against you um yeah you know, i'll tell you my wish for this game it doesn't often come true but it's when ava wins a summoner on summoner battle by causing the other one to take inactivity damage because she can escape getting hit i just love ava winning against a one life summoner just by being like, nah, nah, can't catch me. You can't attack anything, and you're just going to take inactivity damage and die. Yeah. All right, yeah. let's see what's happening. <laughs> all right, all right. So what do, we, what do we got? What do we got? We got, oh, cave goblins. You know, we didn't talk turn one advantage. Cave goblins are um, significantly have an easier time of it when they go first. You know, their win rate is significantly higher when they go first. I think, um, gosh, I don't remember who went first in Vanguards versus um, Cave Goblins when we had Aaron and Shampoo earlier. But this is this is why Sneaks is painful. You know, you're you're just that Steward is still alive though. One hit point Steward with um, Avians is not bad because you can hide them. You know, they can teleport to safety and um, attack again. But this is... All right, there we got the diver. So, like you said, auto damage. We don't really have any other great targets, like one, you know, one kill, like zooming over a slinger just yet. So this is kind of classic cave goblins where it feels a little bit hopeless. I hope Ava has a gate in hand. And I she got sure my does. wish. <laughs> <laughs> and let's see actually what's going to happen. Are we going to go for sneaks? We're going to go for sneaks rather than the beast rider. Interesting. And can we get some extra damage? Yeah, I feel like something I will struggle with. Ooh, that's, that is huge. 
That nice is one. a nice, <laughs> nice. Can we get another three on there? Just knock him out of the game. All right. Well, we'll we'll take it. We'll take it. Um. What you want to do is get sneaks down to about. Whoa! I was gonna say seven health, and we got him down to five health. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the risk always with sneaks. You know, I could pull you chapter and verse from Fizka's uh, Cave Goblin's Guide about um, wanting to expose him early because a lot of times you want him to tank damage rather than have what, a fragile slinger or one of his, you know, cheapo commons die. But there is always the risk of the other player getting a big attack first. There's a few factions that can kill sneaks in turn two, which would have been hilarious, by the way, if that <laughs> ever happens on stream and the game's over in five minutes. Um, yeah. Ava definitely did what she could, but now look at this board state. She's crammed into a corner and the horde is advancing. So is we still have a game. Sneaks can easily slide himself to safety. It's kind of unfortunate if he's, if he's out of commission this early. Um, yeah. But, you know, this is why I love Summoner Wars. It's just because the board states can get so dynamic so fast. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I'd, I'd predict from this that, like, if I was playing Sneaks, I would take him out of the game and never come back. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I would also predict that Sneaks is going to be ahead on board for, like, the majority of the game, <laughs> at least just from this. Like, because Ava to take down all these units is basically an attack for every single one. And there's already enough units on the board to take more than two full turns uh, to clear. Yeah. Uh, Ava's going to be behind on board for a long time. Yeah. I mean, this is classic Cave Goblin. Like, I, I when I'm playing against Cave Goblins that, that get an opening like this, it's just that feeling of being underwhelmed and hopeless. You know, overwhelmed, overrun, and what am I going to do? You know, and that's, you know, that's their game. You know, that's why this faction exists is... You look at a board state like this and ask, how is it possible to, you know, to come back from this? And the answer yeah. is you're going to, you know, oh, God, I hate early unrelenting. I hate it. Oh, that is, that is just an, a nail in the coffin. Because <laughs> uh, uh, now no, no magic going to the next turn. Uh, but I mean, Ava could definitely set up and just hold on for a while. I feel, I feel like something I struggle with with Ava is like a lot of times if I'm if some if the opponent takes the aggressive to me, I'm just going to be like, OK, I'll I'll sit back and just like set up some lines and just defend myself. Um, but then I end up kind of losing the value game because like her birds aren't that great for value. And so. I don't know. I feel like I'll struggle with her because I'm because I play for the value game too much on defense. Um, I don't, and so I, I I kind of like test strike going for this gate further up. Well, I probably I would have opted for a gate like probably in my back row, honestly, uh, just to like keep myself safe and defend for as long as possible. Um, but I can I can get that wrong about the birds. Another gate. Uh, we we love to hear it. Oh, and the fire league vine gate too. Not the I, I feel like the hide behind a gate is when you're just kind of dead. You're not getting your three attacks in. Yeah. But this is kind of the classic, I'm gonna protect my flank and I'm still gonna get an attack in between those gates. Oh. Well, at least the Beast Rider needs magic to be summoned again. So I mean that's your classic who do you go for on these unrelenting turns? You know, the ones that are relatively either occupy a space you don't want them to occupy or that are at least expensive to resummon. And if there's a champ on the board, obviously you want to go for that too. Sometimes you go for sneaks. This is still very much the desperation stage of the Cave Goblins game. <laughs> yeah. You know, they have so much early advantage, but if they can't press that early advantage, then the tide turns when they start running out of deck. Yeah, it's funny because I honestly like the the cave goblin fright. I feel like in my mind is honestly inversed. Like I I see the cave goblins and I think, oh, phew, this is going to be easy. I just I just 
keep a bunch of units in front and never let them back and then eventually i'll win um <laughs> what 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 when, I, when i'm playing against them um that, that very often is not the case <laughs> but for some reason that's the mindset i've internalized playing against them is I'm, I'm not i'm not afraid my mindset honestly is pray to go first <laughs> that's that's my strategy and i actually do think some of the more interesting cave goblin games is when you're going second and you have to and when i'm cave goblins and i'm going second and I have to adapt a little bit from just having my foot permanently on the glass. Yeah, yeah. You know, I actually enjoy, you know, this is me. I enjoy playing kind of the in the, sl the the underdog cave goblin position. All right, and Sneaks has managed to get himself back into the action with a forward gate. So Sneaks is pretty darn well protected here. Interesting. Opting to try to destroy this gate here. Uh -oh. so what we what, what I mean, we... Ava's still well, hey, wait, oh, Ava's at zero magic. Yeah, that's she can't that's, that's, that's why <laughs> that's why Fis did if Fis did that is because she can't just summon a unit, get behind sneaks and get two more damage in. Yeah. And, that and is rough. Estrek even I... mentioned that in our chat. Uh that oh, some more magic would have been nice. And they, they held on to two <laughs> cards last turn. And I would say, like, any two cards in Ava's deck in this situation, I I would not hold. I, I would. I would want the two magic. Um, yeah, I think I would. I, I can't imagine a situation where I want cards more than magic. So it can really be tough. I think like the cave goblins matchup really exemplifies that with like. A lot of factions, it's like, oh, this event, I really need it for my combo and my late game. And when, when, I'm, when I'm against cave goblins, it's just like, nope, I need tempo. Like, <laughs> I am not, I like, I, I, I'm not playing whatever, like, I'm not playing an Abu Ashi game. I'm not playing a Shadow Elves game where, like, I'm creating my own combo. It's like, no, I'm playing a defend from the goblins game. Like, I just, I need to, I need to get tempo on the board. And I don't care I, um, what I have to ditch for that. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, it's rough. It's I, but the the thing is, Avians aren't really a big combo deck. Where I mean, yes, you know, Sky Assault, but they're not. They're not. They're not actually dependent on Sky Assault to win against Cave Goblins. You know, so that's kind of their big combo piece. You don't really want to let go of, but their commons are so good. In this case, I would definitely make sure I have something summonable. You know, I would definitely pitch Cyrook. I would burn Cyrook in a heartbeat to get one magic in this game. And I know we all get attached to Cyrook, but you kind of don't need their champs. You know, their commons are that good. Yeah. But, you know, I would be hoping for like an, you know, I, I don't know if I would burn a gate in this situation, but I would definitely not be trying to put down all five gates all over the course of the game. I don't know, we're just speculating on what could have been burned and wasn't. Yeah. Um, cause... All right, her gratis says always hold Guilford. No, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm itching for a fight with chat. Yeah, I feel like G Gil Guilford's gotten a lot of slack. <laughs> Uh, oh my gosh, Gilf uh, Jexic was destroying me with Guilford in my very brief foray into deck building. You know, Guilford in Mountain Vargath was just a nightmare. Yeah. Um, Guilford in Sky Spear Avians, you always have to think: Is this worth? You know, a fistful of commons. Is this worth three commons? All right, so let's see. We are closing in. I don't blame Ava at all for trying to just make an escape to that um, top right section of the board. Yeah, unfortunately, leaving that gate open kind of spells the end of her. <laughs> um, yeah. Some some divers and another gate. Like, like I mean, most summoners, you would be like, this is 100% over. Can't do a thing. Uh, against Ava, like she's kind of special. Um, 
she she could she could run place some more gates decide to set up in the right side of this board and be like i don't care about that backside anymore um she, she's got options so it's it's not it, it's not over uh though it is yeah. looking very tough i'd be surprised if the shrike was holding on to gathering song that's one i would be super tempted to keep in this game like just if i need to escape and just get my colony somewhere yeah Oof, and an enrage the horde would be so rough right now. I'm guessing they don't have it with that attack though, because I think if you had enraged the horde, I think you'd attack with the clinger. No, you get three attacks either way. Oh my god, cave goblins get so many attacks. <laughs> just, really not, even, not fair. Just destroying the gates. It wasn't even. <laughs> Well, I hope Ava has divers in hand. I hope she has divers and gathering song in hand. Come on, can, can we keep this guy alive at least? Oof. <laughs> Oof. And, That's and this... one where you just like pray for the RNG to give you a coin flip. <laughs> you know, just just like I mean, it's not a coin flip. It's it's you know, two for two swords is pretty reliable, but not such great odds that you can't just pray for a whiff and just keep that one unit alive there's so the, the, there's there's the s tier factions and then there is the cave goblins tier the highest yes. tier above all all right you know we're we've been gosh i feel like if there's divers coming out like they're coming out now without thought and there they are you know like i want <laughs> that might be a second ahead of you you're a second ahead of me because I'm watching on the Twitch stream. I'm going to switch right. <laughs> oh, so it, unfair. Be, All right, I'm going to switch there could be watching like, the game link. Come on. I'm, I'm going to watch the three game more link. divers in hand. <laughs> There's, it's so juicy right now with all these clingers. I, I have to agree with you. It's, it's probably not there um, if we're thinking about it. But just one, one more diver. <laughs> one more diver. <laughs> And then Ava moves forward and places a gate and decides to try to assassinate sneaks or something. Um, oh, that would be sweet. Uh, did I call Gathering Song or did uh, I call Gathering Song? You sure did. <laughs> well, two divers in a Gathering Song would have been quite a bit more optimal than one. We got a gate. All right, we got a gate. We got a gate. it doesn't go down next turn. It might. It probably will, but it's fine. No, if we summon the diver in front of the gate, I don't know. We're we just playing for survival. Exactly. I mean, I, it's <laughs> never not the gate might go down the next turn against cave goblins. Like, it could be a five-life gate that you're just praying survives another turn. And over there. It feels a little bit dangerous. It seems like this gate is guaranteed going down if you don't defend it with just a beast rider. They could have another gate. They you, could you have could. another gate in but hand. I, ideally, I want to I summon units next turn, you know. <laughs> um, and they're up to five magic. That's funny. With the beast rider back here, I, I think I would have... Oh, okay. Yes, I guess the clinger gets there. That's, that's a little mean. Um, if you summoned a Beast Rider on this gate on the left, you could do a lateral charge and roll four dice on the gate. Because now, now the gate might survive. It's enough to ask why um, Jessica didn't do that, actually. I mean, never punished. Yeah. <laughs> never punished. All right, and if the diver goes down, I'm not seeing a lot more hope the worst is when even if if you have the shrike has two gates in hand and builds a fort you're dead after that fort goes down yeah yeah oh i mean there's nothing to attack at this point but this is just <laughs> Yeah, you know, and oh, enrage the horde oh. here. Enrage the horde for like one or two damage. Okay, of course it was three damage. Uh, 
you know, that's, that's fine. No, if this goes rolling well, I will say that <laughs> it's it's always that insult to injury when your 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 opponent, you know, got the turn one advantage. You know, is play. You know, the faction gets to play exactly the way they want, and the dice are good. You know, I with all of these rolls, I would have just been like, "Give me something. Give me one stinking break." You know, let that diver survivor survive a turn. Let the gate survive. Just give me something to work with. Yeah. All right. This is a fair bit of think time, which I'm hoping is think time to do something as opposed to think time just I. I got nothing. Go forward three spaces and place two gates. That's the play. <laughs> We're coming after snakes. You just you just can't come after snakes. Like no, it's they, painful to be sitting there at five yeah. magic too. I mean, yeah. I'm rooting for there to be like three divers in hand. Uh there sure isn't. <laughs> no, if there are three divers in hand, they're coming out. All right, this is kind of Ava's last stand here. It's hard to imagine placing a gate or even two gates that such that both Ava and A-Gate survive. This is a situation where you just want Ava to go three for three to have something to show for the last, you know, the probable last turn of the game, and it never happens. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you roll, like you can't even get that final kill just for personal satisfaction yeah yeah at least we went three spaces forward like <laughs> put some pressure on but yeah there, there's something about these aggro factions the factions with the instinct symbol that can just be so satisfying <laughs> with games like this like with with balls are and grognak where you've just like you've surrounded your opponent's gates and then you've destroyed your opponent's gates and it just feels great um and that that sort of that sort of playstyle can be very risky because like well like you put a bunch of dice into a gate and then they oh my god this is and... just this this is just like the pile on for good measure Sneaks coming really in. Do. Sneaks coming in for the final kill. I, I, I hope they miss I... every single one of these dice <laughs> and lose oh. the game. <laughs> ah, next time. You know, people have their internal rules, and I think a lot of them have my summoner, if possible, my summoner gets the kill. Yeah. <laughs> um. Oh my goodness. Are you. Oh. Uh, the Shrike is showing us their hand, which I'm not actually sure when when in the game this was, but they had one turn of their hand was Sky Assault, Wrath, Guilford, Battle Song, and Cyrook. That is just uh, that just drives me insane. <laughs> like the the three, you know, the, the just the the three champ magic clog. I assume that was somewhere before the five magic turn where, you know, if, if they had a gate, they could have summoned something. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you know, Fizka says, sorry, yeah, that was one of those gobos go first and draw perfectly situations. <laughs> you know, it really was. <laughs> We do have, t I mean, I, I'm happy to bring in these guys to chat. I am also happy to play again. We probably do have time if we want to offer that. Oh, that's true. Well, what do I you just... think? Should we just chat? Let's join the voice chat. Let's, let's chat true. and then think about it. All right. All righty. For, for first order of business, Fizka, what tier are the cave goblins? Oh, for sure. <laughs> but slightly below wayfarers, as I have said repeatedly. <laughs> Uh, well, no one wants to hear like the little asterisk qualification footnote. 
you know, that's what you get for being a PhD, but most of us aren't PhDs. So we just want Dave Album up here. Yeah, I, I, uh, they, they, they're, they're, they're fun to play when you draw like that. <laughs> yes. For yeah, sure. they're one of my favorites to play too. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Uh, well, real quick before we before we chat about the game, um, if I could just have you guys introduce yourselves real quick and how you got into Summoner Wars, uh, maybe crap Fizka. There we go, Fizka. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, could, could we could we start with you? Um, what? How did you get into Summoner Wars, and what keeps you interested? Sure. Uh, so I started playing back in first edition um, and uh, played on the app for, I don't know, probably about a year or two. Um, ended up buying everything, but but only I've, I've got I've been, I'm based in Toronto and I have one friend of mine here that plays, but not a not a ton of local games. So eventually when the app stopped being supported, uh, lost interest and uh, didn't. And then but I, I've been a huge fan of Plat Hat other games um i think i own almost all of them and so when they were launching second edition i was uh beyond excited uh and so i think i was i signed up uh, almost immediately after the beta opened so i've been playing playing cave goblin since the beginning uh, originally against breakers and um what keeps me interested is actually the strategic depth. Um, I think it's just absolutely incredible how much depth there is in the game, how much skill there is. Um, and with all of the new factions that are being released, it's it's now gotten to the point where it's quite difficult to keep up and, and be aware of how all of the factions play for me. But um, but I think it, it's pretty incredible what they've been able to do to keep things balanced and fun as they've expanded. Yeah, absolutely. Uh... I love to hear that. Um, I haven't played many of uh, Plat Hat's other games. I, I I played Dead of Winter once, and that was fun. Um, that's about all I know. Forbidden Waters is a huge amount of fun. Uh, if you like anything that's role playing adjacent, and the app, and the voice acting, and it, it's a huge amount of fun. I haven't tried Freelancers yet, but I look forward to trying that out. Uh, my wife and I have gotten into Mice and Mystics for a while, which I think is a game that's designed for ten year olds. So, uh, but but we really enjoyed it. I, I want to make sure we talk about Summoner Wars first, but I'm actually eager to hear both your thoughts um, about. Mice and Mystics, um, and um, I guess neither of you played Familiar Tales, but I'm looking at those games for my eight-year-old, so it'll be, it'll be interesting. But I do I don't want to hijack the conversation, but I know you both have experience with that, so I'm very curious. I'm also curious, but real quick, uh, Test Strike, if you could introduce yourself or Test Strike. Oh, I haven't Test Strike. Uh, names are so hard today. Uh, yeah, yeah, that works. Uh, yeah, Bob, yeah. I just figured it was an intentional typo that I wasn't going to try to like voice typo. <laughs> did, 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 yeah, did, yeah, did I? Did I? Is that was that typo wrong in the thing that I wrote? Oh goodness. No, I thought. Oh, I didn't know. Oh so. no, it is. It is. It is. It's wrong. <laughs> I wrote Strike oh, instead you of wrote Strike. The strike. <laughs> This is I, I, you spelled. <laughs> uh, no, I did. I did anyway. Uh, y y ignore that. Ignore that. That's fine. But uh, Tetrick, how did you um get get into get into Summoner Wars? Uh, and and what what do you enjoy about it? Yeah, I first heard about it from the the Shut Up and Sit Down video, whatever that was, a few years ago. But then I never actually uh, played until sometime around a year ago. My brother in law introduced me to it, and I don't know. It's just the perfect thing to hook me. I you know I love. Uh, games with distinct uh, decks and lots of different uh, card combinations of decks that can go against each other and on a spatial board. Yeah, it's a, it's a crack for my brain for sure. And so I've, I just got super into it after after you introduced me. Uh, I've All the decks that I've been attracted to have been the super mobile ones. And then my, my path to uh, actually improving at Summoner Wars has been learning not to give in to the impulse to charge forward with them all the time. Uh, unless, yeah. you know, like we just saw a minute ago, you get a you get a really good good hand where you really need to. I feel like that's uh, and I have I haven't played Mice and Mystics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, uh, I haven't played Mice and Mystics, but I have played uh, Familiar Tales, and my seven year old really loves it. No, I'd love to hear more about it again. Not to hijack the strategy <laughs> conversation, but um, yeah, I'd definitely like to branch out into more plaid hat games. Um, yeah, you know, more of these games as my kids get older. You want to just talk about it for ten minutes? I, I'm, I'm very curious as well. Uh. I feel 
pulled so many things in my head at a time, but I wouldn't, if you guys don't mind. Yeah. No, so, okay, so, so both of you, like, first of all, familiar tales, how much, how much, um, how much is it you have to commit to a gaming group and go through the entire story? Um, I think whoever the game is for, like, if it's for, uh, one or two of your kids, you probably want them in every one, uh, every game that's being played. But I think you can swap in parents who uh, are there mostly to enjoy it with their kids as opposed to, you know, absorb the full narrative. Um, it, it's pretty easy to swap out the the parents, I think, uh, depending on who's available to play in the night. Yeah, and, and I haven't, I've only, we've only played it once. Um, we don't have kids, but we've tried to get our niece and nephew into it. But the problem is we only see them two or three times a year, and so it's been difficult. Um, and they're not big gamers, so I did find, so um, my niece is 12 and my nephew's 10, and I did find for them getting comfortable with the rules and playing it was challenging. But like I said, they haven't, they don't do a ton of games, so it was a, it was a bit of a new experience for them, and I think they were getting a little bored during the, the intro adventure. Um, I suspect if, uh, you know, if they were here for two weeks, uh, then we would, uh, we would quickly convert them. It did seem like a really, really solid game from what I saw. Yeah, it's been taking at least, uh, like, bare minimum 90 minutes for us to do one of the chapters. Uh often two hours, and sometimes that's a little tough to fit in before a bedtime. Um, that, that other one, I, I can't remember the name of that somebody was talking about in chat uh, the other day, it looked like it had a shorter play time, which uh, uh, would be a plus, plus for me. Mice and Mystics, I think, is a similar timeline, if I, uh, if I recall. And uh, my wife and I played through the whole campaign together, and it was a lot of fun. Um, I mean, we both also played D and D and really like the uh, the role playing piece and it was it was cool the stories were cool the mecha- it was it's hard is one thing that I remember being shocked by for a game that like I said I thought was designed for ten year olds it's really hard we lost a lot um, which uh, was was a bit of a shock um, but it's uh, it's quite a good game um, the minis come unpainted so it, it's also one of those things where if you happen to uh, and I don't remember whether there's minis in Familiar Tales. I think there are. But if you happen to yeah. have kids that are crafty that might be interested in getting into mini painting, it's also, I think, a, a cool opportunity there, too. I didn't even think of that. I think they would love it. And so I have a, an eight-year-old and a four-year-old. And the problem's always been how do you involve the four-year-old without them just kind of, you know, derailing the game. Um, but they would both love the mini painting. I'm not saying the four-year-old would do a good job, but they would love it. Yeah. Yeah, who, who cares? It's not like they would be painting for, uh, for an audience or anything. I actually really love that idea. <laughs> like, just make that a separate thing. Although it's, you know, it stretches out the time you have to commit to it. But, you know. So remind me, the Shrike, are you playing with just, were you two parents, one seven-year-old? Um, who, what's the player um, group, actually? Yeah, we've only played it with our, our seven-year-old. Uh, our second is getting uh, old enough. She could probably start joining in. She's, uh, she's five. Um, but we haven't, uh, we haven't tried it with her yet. Okay, so is it often like one parent with the one parent with the seven year, or is it just just because our problem is just if it's two, there's not a lot of time for like two parents to, you know, play with the eight year old without having to have someone on the four year old. Like usually, it's yeah, kind of cram it into a nap, but there's a million other things competing for nap time. Like, how do you manage it? Um, right now, the, uh, the plan, <laughs> at least on the calendar, is that. Uh, uh, every Wednesday is a game night with a kid, and we alternate uh, which kid it is, uh, and they get to pick the game, and they're the one who get prioritized for playing whatever they pick. And sometimes they'll pick something that uh, the other sibling also can play or wants to play, and then um, more kids might be in it. But And then, yeah, it, it depends uh, uh, on whether or not the other kids are in bed, whether or not they get to play with one parent or both parents. And- Tales, you don't have to, if, if I recall from when I played it, you don't have to maintain, like the same person doesn't have to play everything. So what you probably do, and I assume this is probably what you do to strike, to strike, yeah, I'm doing it now, is um, <laughs> you probably have the, your uh, seven-year-old have a dedicated character that they play and then you play, you guys play everybody else. 
They have actually, uh, he has actually picked uh, different characters. He'll pick whichever one he feels like. Uh, mm-hmm. And in Familiar Tales, there's not really, not a, a ton of uh, continuity. You discover new uh, weapons or cards or whatever, but, but they just get added um, to that character. And then you can decide, oh, do I want to play the, the stuffed bear who uh, we found the claws for last time? Or do I want to play you know, this, other, this other rabbit or whatever? I think Dice and Mystics was a pretty similar setup, but but the one thing I will say about Familiar Tales is with the app and the fact that they have the voice acting and things like that, which I am reasonably certain I remember correctly being pretty high quality, and also I'm not confusing it with Forgotten Waters, I hope, um, which also has that. But I, I think that that's an upgrade over just written written material for, for younger kids from a just stimulus perspective. But I'm also not a parent, so that uh, that may be an overstatement. Nice. I didn't know there was an app. Well, I'll have to look for that. I'm, I might be. I might be imagining that then. So okay. Have you asked? No, I thought familiar tales. That was one of the draws. Was the voice acting? I feel like I'm getting games a little bit confused. But Mice and Mystics definitely didn't have that, right? Your kind oh, of yeah, it was, adventuring party. Yeah, it was like yeah. That game came out probably 12 years ago. I don't think the technology really existed. I think the first one that Platt had did that had all of that built into it was Forgotten Waters, but I think Forgotten Waters went well enough that I think they built it into Familiar Tales, and then I know they did it with Freelancers as well. So you can play Familiar Tales without it, though? Like, if you're just like, we're just shutting off all electronics and... You know, this is our in-person time. You don't have to have the app. Was that also true of Forgotten Waters? Or did you need the app? Um, I think I think it would be... Di- I mean, you can read it, but everything's online. You can't... There's no... You have to have an online device in order to play Forgotten Waters. Okay, and we're not hmm. sure about familiar tales off the top of our heads. Yeah, I don't know if it has an app, but it definitely works uh, without an app. And I think you're supposed to like pass the book around, and each person gets a chance at reading or narrating. Uh, though I usually um, end up reading most of it out loud. The gameplay, like, how does it feel in terms of gameplay and story going together? Uh, I feel like the maps, the sets are pretty good at giving you. Um, a tone and uh, the the minis for the the bad guys are are uh, really fun and it, it does feel nice and intimidating when you like flop over uh, you know three cards off the enemy deck and these these uh, these scary scary monsters appear on the map. Um, yeah, the story isn't uh, isn't crazy as I recall it, but it does. There's the theme of. Um, you're you're saving a, a saving a girl and uh having to fight you know fight off the things that kids are scared of in their dreams that sort of thing and as far as hitting that tone i think it, it does it did a pretty good job well and that's part of what i've loved about almost every plaid hat game i've played um and you know ben you mentioned dead of winter they do such a good job in my view of having something that has that depth of theme Um, And it's one of the things I've been incredibly impressed with in Summoner Wars, right around all the different factions, just how how well they feel like what they've been designed to do. It's um, it's a pretty incredible design gift from my perspective that seems to be baked into the company's DNA. Oh, my God. Yeah, the art and what the card does. It always feels correct. And how? kids enjoying like the game you know I, I feel like it's a lot of moving parts like do your kids enjoy the gameplay or the story or just the spending time with parents i don't care what we're doing like what's the draw for them i'm kid singular i'm getting a little bit confused who and which kid but i'm asking <laughs> to, sh- to strike yeah i think he he really gets super into it he loves controlling a character i think he loves uh, I mean, he likes uh, video games too, but I think, you know, we all love moving minis around on a board and yes. hitting scary bad guys, right? And he's he gets super into that too. And, okay, let me, um, and it's, my, okay, here, here's another one. So, so, so Mike, is, oh, you know what? I was getting, I was, remind me again. 
you okay Fiska and your wife without kids have played mice and mystics yeah you um to shrike have played stuffed you're playing stuffed fables with your son yes or have i gotten that completely confused i think that's and correct. in familiar tales none of us is sure about what's going on with the um the app and the voice narration and how and you've tried familiar tales is the one that fiska has tried with a nine and 11 year old oh yeah and sorry i was, was confusing just... stuffed fables and familiar tales there I was, was too, bad. actually. I was actually confusing for a moment who's played what with which kids, and are they their own? So we've covered all three games, and <laughs> the one that went over well with kids was Stuffed Fables with a seven year with a seven year old boy, um, yeah. and and or one or two parents, kind of on an every other week basis. Have yeah. I got that? Have I gotten all that straight? Like, do I pass the quiz? And I'm sorry, I feel like I'm. It, I, I don't, you know, it's it's our stream. But I do feel like I'm hijacking <laughs> it because I'm really curious about these games with kids. Um, how did it, you know? I'll ask this about stuffed fables since I feel like the fact that it involves bedwetting comes up a lot in reviews. Like, how did that actually play out with your kid? Like. Like, I feel like that, for some reason, that plot point seems to get, I don't know, everyone seems to mention it in reviews, and I'm wondering if I'm kind of putting too much, you know, credence to it. Like, oh, you know, kids don't, whatever. I'll let you Interesting. talk. Interesting. Yeah, I don't think that, I don't think that stuck out. Uh, it, there's, that was, was just one of the things that it felt like they were tossing in to give the background of uh, anxiety that the little girl is feeling that you're trying to protect her from we should for the sake of listeners go over what all the general plot points of all these are stuffed fables, and everyone anyone jump in correct me if i'm wrong so stuffed fables is when you're a group of stuffies protecting a real life little girl from bad dreams right right yeah and some of the story you uh, you it's from the perspective of, like the parents talking about the little girl um or you know the to hear the parents talk about the little girl while she's falling asleep. Okay, so you kind of cut back and forth a little bit between like what the stuffies are doing and what the humans are doing? Yeah, a little bit, I think. It's mostly oh. from the stuffies' perspective. Okay. And then familiar tales is when you're a bunch of real animals, not stuffed animals, and you have a baby princess that you're raising? Uh, yeah. I've only played the first adventure in it, the, the first scenario, so I don't actually know where the story goes. But yeah, that that's the setup: is that you are a set of a set of wizards familiars that are protecting a, a baby that I think eventually becomes a girl. So I can see why the two the two games are easy to confuse. Well, um, they're super confused in my head, and not the least because someone posted to the Discord that image from familiar tales that basically looks like celeste holding a baby you know yep. celeste celeste from summoner wars wayfarers holding a baby <laughs> is now the image in my head of um you know what familiar tales actually is um but that was actually what got me intrigued by the game like maybe i should start this with my kids and last but not least just to disambiguate the three games in my head mice and mystics are the ones where you were once human, you are now turned into mice, and now you're trying to fight your way out of this scary haunted house type thing. Do I have that right? First, that is correct. You used to be humans and you're turned into mice, um, and you are trying to defeat an, I think it was an evil witch who has captured the kingdom. Um, and uh, one of the mice is the prince, and the other mice are people that... Um, I think he meets on his other mice that he meets on his voyage or something like that, if I remember correctly. So you fight things like cockroaches and rats and centipedes and that type of thing. That would go over with kids. You said the gameplay was difficult. Uh, no, that one. So the yeah, so the difficulty level is high. So we found we lost a lot of scenarios, but the the uh, complexity isn't that bad. Okay, so difficult but not complex. I actually really like that. 
Like yeah. that is actually super, super cool. Not something you always find in a game. I want to lose. Yeah. I want to lose always. Yes! Yeah. <laughs> it's fun. It's not fun when it's too easy. Yeah. Oh my gosh! No, we've we. I think there have been a lot of people that have come had conversations on the Discord about this. That you know, first of all, people were talking about other games that are difficult and that you lose a lot. And I think there's also this. I think this community consensus that Summoner Wars appeals to people who are not afraid to spend the early part of their career getting pummeled. <laughs> like, I think there's just something so, you know, so in- you have to find it fun to go through well, that uh... frustration wall. It feels like such a breath of fresh air to me to have a ranked multiplayer where I'm not locked in playing people, you know, within 50 points of my elo. Like I can, I can run into the the guy who's you know top of the pile right now and you know get a chance to play him. And there's not a ton of online games that'll let you get spanked like that. Oh my goodness, this is me with the mic, but um, I remember when we were talking on the Discord about, you know, how do we make it easier for new players? And I think Reeve 3 was talking about that soft, what, what, I, I'm going to misremember the term, but that thing where you start new players off against an AI just to kind of guarantee that they get a couple wins. And I'm sitting there listening like, I know you're right, but I hate this. Yeah. You know, I know you're right about kind of the both the teaching value and the appeal of feeling like you're good at this game. So, you know, let new players beat up an AI that they don't know is an AI that they think is a real person and a real opponent. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, you'll get a different kind of player. Like, I, I got really into Frozen Synapse like 12 years ago or so, and I got really hooked the moment I got hooked was I was on like the third level or something playing against the AI and I just got destroyed. Like every one of my guys killed within like a five second span. And that was the point where I was hooked on the game. Like that was what told me. It's like, Oh, I have to figure this system out. With yeah. Two, two of my, players. Oh, go on. Go yeah. on. I was going to say two of my favorite uh, uh, genres of games are the souls like games and, uh, Fire Emblem playing on hard mode. Um, so yeah, I, I I agree. I like getting stopped. I think Summoner Wars, there was definitely kind of the, you know, the river to be crossed for me was just playing against online opponents, period. Like I have actually never done that before and was never really strongly interested in it. I remember my husband and I used to play um, you know, we played, you know, before kids, we played a lot more games, but, you know, Innovation and Race for the Galaxy were two of my favorite couple of games ever. And I distinctly remember when he started playing Innovation online on Isotropic, and he wasn't even doing it intensively or anything, but he got pretty unbeatable. And that was just, <laughs> that, that definitely tilted the tables for us. Um, my wife. I, I was sorry, sorry. Oh no, go on. No, no, I'm interrupting. I you go. I I I go go go. No, no, I was just saying that, you know, but even like playing innovation on isotropic, I think I maybe tried once or twice, but I just wasn't really comfortable with the idea or interested in it, or maybe not wedded enough to innovation to want to go online and try and become able to be my husband again. But I mean, Summoner Wars, I had to jump in because the AI, the AI was so bad that, you know, what do you use it for other than to learn the rules? And I think just having the Discord and having real opponents, I kind of found it scary and weird not being that kind of gamer. And, you know, a year on, look at me now, like, what am I doing on Twitch? But it was definitely, definitely a journey for me. And, you know, I, I joined before there was ranked play, so you could face anyone. I always seem to draw Orange Lazarus when trying a faction for the very first time. <laughs> like, that always seemed to be the matchmaking. It was always, like, great. 
Like, this is the very top player in the game, and I'm, like, learning the rules. Um, but, but, um, Fisk, I think you were, I lost track of which voice. Someone, someone was jumping in to say something, and I'm done with my spiel. I, I had exactly, my wife and I have had exactly the same experience, where either her or I will get into a game online, and then immediately be in a position where the other person just can't even come close to beating them. I think we have, I don't know, a half dozen games that we own that we don't play anymore because it's not fun for one or the other of us. So um, <laughs> I can certainly sympathize. Which, which games and who went online for them? Uh, so the one that she did was Galaxy Trucker. Um, <laughs> I didn't even know that was an online game. I didn't oh my know God. I love Galaxy Yeah, there's, a, there's an iPad app for it, um, or an I, iOS app for it at least. It looks Maybe kind of Android. awesome. Do they have like, um, little animations like your spaceship can actually fly and stuff, or tries to fly? Yeah, it does, and there's a story mode to it, um, which is pretty well done. Um, but yeah, she got to the point where she was just unbeatable on that. Um, the games for me, um, Puerto Rico. Um, oh, what's that game about growing corn in uh, in Mesoamerica uh, with the pyramids? Anyway, there's a game about growing corn in Mesoamerica with the pyramids. Uh, yeah, with yeah. pyramid. Uh, that uh, <laughs> there's a bunch of those games that I used to play on board game arena. Um, and there were games that she would tolerate when we had friends over. Um. They weren't her favorite style, but she would tolerate them. And then I played a bunch online, and then it wasn't fun for anyone. So we don't play those as much anymore. Do you still play them online? Nope. Summoner Wars is the only um, the only multiplayer game I play now. It's it's so deep. There's so much variety. I, I haven't I haven't had any interest in. I mean, I literally was playing a ton on Board Game Arena, and then Summoner Wars came, Second Edition came out, and then I I think I stopped playing on Board Game Arena a week later, and haven't played now since. I mean, I don't know how long it's been since the beta came out. I feel like a couple of years now, at least. How curious. When Summoner Warmore's um, first edition was on the app, did that, did, you know, were you just Summoner Wars then, or were you also kind of playing board game arena stuff? Mostly Summoner Wars then, too. Um... But it did get to the point where there were matchups that were just broken. And I really enjoy, I always like playing the um, undervalued, underappreciated uh, factions for any asymmetrical game. Like, I always like being the underdog. And it got very frustrating when I would, I remember playing Waterdee at one point. We had a challenge session where he was like, I can show you that you literally cannot beat Phoenix Elves with Fallen Kingdom. And I think we played 20 times in a row and I couldn't beat him once. And I was like one of the <laughs> top two or three Fallen Kingdom players at the time. Um, and so I, I got a little frustrated and, and that was part of kind of losing interest as the app stopped being supported. That's fascinating. I think I left before all of the etch garbage uh, got super popular though. So I, I managed to miss that, which my understanding was pretty, pretty ugly. You know, it's funny. I Water D is probably the reason I never really dove into first edition because I kept stalking it, but then there'd be this guy Water D on the forums talking about just these broken things that to me sounded unfun. You know, huh. like killing your own units for magic. Like this you know, it just always rubbed me the wrong way. But then I kept coming back when new factions came out and I'd read those little lore blurbs and I'd kind of want to try it again. And then Waterdeep would point out something else that was broken <laughs> that the new factions didn't quite fix. So I had this very strange, like, stalking the game, sort of, I wouldn't say stalking Waterdeep, but definitely they both left a strong impression on me. And then when t second edition came out, and Waterdee gave it his blessing with this, you know, amazing review on Board Game Geek. Um, you know, I was like, okay, I have to try this. <laughs> you know, I don't think that we've brought anyone on that's actually had my story of like, I read a Board Game re Geek review and <laughs> I had to try it. I think we've had a bunch of people say that they got into it via probably the same shut up and sit down review. But I'm, I'm curious. Do you think the number of. Mm -hmm. 
Do you think the number of factions makes it difficult for people to join on nowadays? I do. I want to hear more about this. I, I want you to expound on what it's like to jump in kind of that much later than the rest of us did. Well, I mean, I, I came in during season one, so it, it didn't feel like a crazy number of decks. Like it felt like, right. I don't know, right. not I don't know, normal for an asymmetric game. But oh no, I mean, so, so I actually want to hear both your perspectives, but I did mean like you came in so much, so Fis Fiska came in so much earlier than to Shrike that I totally want to hear both these perspectives of what it's like kind of coming in early and having these decks kind of grow with you, and then what it's like coming in late when there's so many decks already. Um, but, you know, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I just want to make sure I hear from both of you, because I'm super interested in this. Yeah, it doesn't feel like I came in super late, because there have been, uh, what, six new decks that came out since I started? Is that right? Okay, maybe. So it, it does feel like a much bigger number of decks now than when I started. Yeah, so remind me, you know what, I got the voices confused slightly, so that's why I sound a little bit schizophrenic, because I lost track of who's who, but when did, what, what deck was newest when you came in? Just so I can remember the chronology. Or do you remember, I, like, what was, your, what was the first new deck that appeared for you? Maybe that's an easier question. Let's see, I think Sand Goblins oh, okay. was you know the first. You know what? For some reason, I think maybe I remembered you as um, as coming in much later. Maybe I remembered you from the dis like maybe I think maybe I remembered you from the Discord much later because Sand Goblins yeah. was actually not. You know what? I'm actually misremembering then how far you know how far back in time before like the name the Shrike like registered to me on the discord yeah i didn't find the discord until relatively recently yeah no that's why i thought you were you know you're newer to me than you're new than to summoner wars which is fine yeah. it's just that it's just me kind of untangling my chronology no i came in not that not like gosh i know fungal uh, fungal dwarves was the new deck for me but I don't think Sand Goblins was that far after. You know, it's not, it's, you're, you're not that far out from me that you're not the person that joined, like, just tomorrow. Or actually, let me, let me check chat, because who is Judy Devlinfish is talking about it. So let me give you, take a moment to read this. Um, steep learning curve, for sure. Playing under the name Devlinfish. Difficulty is what I find fun. The hardest thing is knowing what all the other factions can do and being aware of the combos you need to counter. It's when something happens which you didn't even know was possible. Ah, uh, okay, noted. So many of these moments. I can really relate to that. And I feel like the newer decks, like Wayfarers, have had more of those, of just these, and not just Wayfarers, but like Shadow Elves especially. I think starting from that pair, it's just like, what just hit me? You know, where did that come from? Do you know what yeah, decks I... people have access to nowadays when they start if they're not uh, subscribed? You get one random one, which in my opinion is a bad okay. system. <laughs> yeah. Joe, I mean, I know it's not our business. I wish I knew what the before and after data was on that. Like, you know, is I don't necessarily know what's better for, you know, marketing and sales purposes. Like, do you just frustrate people into buying the decks and subscribing? Or do you frustrate people into quitting the game? When people last complained about it, I think Nick said in the Discord that, like, okay, like, we're going to look into it. So I imagine it's like... I imagine they're thinking about it, about changing it. It's just on the back burner. Yeah, I mean, saying they have numbers we're not privy to, yeah. and I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna, you know, go full, you know, all in on criticism when I don't have the numbers and I don't know if they're getting better sales from the one free deck thing than they did from the, 
Phoenix elves and Tundra orcs always being free to play. One thing you know, that I... I mm-hmm. Sorry. No, go on. I was going to say, one thing that I think will help drive adoption will be the saga modes when they... when they I, I, And I assume what they're trying to do is marry having the saga modes available when they come out with the iOS or Android or Steam apps. Because I do think that gives everybody a chance to see how the different factions play without having to own them um, and starts to deal with some of the, oh, I understand now what the Phoenix Elves can do. So that's been... I would guess that's their adoption strategy, but I, I'm just speculating. Speculating on all these wonderful things that require a lot of work from one developer. <laughs> Fair. I mean, that's that's kind of what it's been like. Like I've never, and I mean, you know, being you know, like you know, like being a software engineer myself, I'm never going to be the one to be like, oh, it's easy. Can't you just do this? You know, can't you just make it configurable? You know, like, can't, you know, can't you do this seemingly easy thing that's not? Um, but definitely, there are things that we all, as a player base, wish for. Um, and that get rolled out slowly, if at all, because I think it's just amazing that Joe's done this all by himself. You know, that this does not look like a one-man band dev show, but it kind of is. Well, particularly when you think about the new mechanics that show up with every new deck, right? Like, I, I'm i not a coder, so I uh, maybe it's easier than it sounds, but it, certainly from my seat, I'm always, I'm always incredibly impressed at the complexity that they've been, a- been able to code in and how few bugs and errors there are, which I think is a testament to the playtest community. Oh, my yeah. goodness. I mean, the playtest community, I, I've told people, like, how grateful I am for it and how much I never want to do it myself. <laughs> You know, like, just, you guys are amazing, just hand me the finished product. But there's definitely people we have that really dive into the nuts and bolts of costing units, and which, you know, just, you know, can argue over, like, the difference in one cost in one life much more than I care about. But I'm the one that consumes the end product and the fruits of their labors and the fruits of all these arguments about minutia. You know, hats off to them, because... I would go nuts if I had to do it. Yeah, I signed up as a playtester for, and I think I managed to playtest one deck. But the problem I ran into was I just couldn't couldn't get because I was playing, you know, the normal games, and then I was trying to get playtest games in, and the decks would like the playtest would change so rapidly, and there would be all these people that would be playing ten, twenty games with these new decks and I would be like coming in brand new. And I just, I got to the point where I felt like I wasn't providing any value. Um, you know, I, I think maybe the one piece of value I could have provided as a play tester would be to do something like, uh, everybody tell me if you want to run cave goblins by me, uh, or want, want me to run cave goblins against this new deck. But beyond that, I just, so I ended up, um, I ended up withdrawing from, from the group, but it, it was incredible the amount of work that went in and the, degree of commitment from the playtester base and just the volunteer base. And that's something that's been really impressive to me in general in this community. I mean, if you think about the Discord and, you know, Fuzzy Marmot folks like yourself that have taken on community roles or stuff like this that Ben set up or the podcast that Aaron and Jexic set up or that, um, what, what are we calling it? The Bob Draft um, thing that I haven't tried yet, but looks really, really cool. Um, like they've done, it's a testament to how good the game is that the amount of community gen or the league, right? And, and some of zone, the amount of community generated content I am blown away by. Oh my gosh. If you asked me a year ago, if I think I'm going to be in that role, I would have just been, are you kidding? I'm not a gamer. I don't play online. I don't do any of these things, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, I've definitely gotten sucked deeper into things that I would never have imagined trying, not the least of which is streaming on Twitch. You know, commenting games on Twitch is safely one of the last things that I would have imagined myself doing when I finally just dipped my toe into playing online for the first time. You know, it's definitely, you know, and it definitely speaks, as you said, to the community. You know, I think just... You know, we all want it to grow. You know, we all want this thing to take off and become mainstream and for the rest of the world to 
realize how great this game is. But I think the community's definitely benefited from being small enough that everyone knows each other, you know, really as people, not just usernames. You know, I mean, I, everyone here is still a username to me. I know a few real names, such as Ben and Aaron. Um, but you're not, like, interacting with, like, anonymous people on the Discord either. You know, it's not, you know, I just always assume, you know, gamers are going to be kind of toxic. You know, they're going to be, like, like drivers on a freeway. You know, you're kind of jerks when you're you're in a bubble and these people don't matter to you. Um, but definitely. Yeah, I'm really hoping Hans One pops into the Discord someday soon. Oh my gosh! Like, where is Hans One? Hans One, yeah. if you're out there, you know, like I feel like I need to beam radio signals or something to him. Like, just right. you know, it's okay not to be a perfect native English speaker. Like, just just <laughs> come play with us. Oh man, I'm just like shouting into the void. The odds of anyone like reporting back to him that someone on Twitch wants us wants you to join the community is low. <laughs> but you just need to make sure that we all uh, uh, throw the tournament to him so that, or her uh, so that they can uh, you know then 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 they'll get them some exposure and they'll hear about the Discord. Oh my I got, gosh, Tortugatron's idea was my favorite. Was that we all spell out with our units one letter at a time <laughs> discord <laughs> that was my favorite <laughs> yeah it was awesome but yeah i i i i'm so curious like like what does everyone even think if this complete stranger wins the tournament <laughs> you know I, and I don't, I, I honestly, I'll, I'll go, I, it seems unlikely that it's, you know, just someone with a different alt. Like, I'll, I, I'll, I'll, I'll stake my claim on, like, we just have no reason to believe that. <laughs> like, it's, the, 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 the top player pool is small enough that I could personally message every single person I think it might, could possibly be. And if I got a no response, I would trust them based on trusting them as a human being. Like at this point, I don't really feel like there's a top player. I don't know well enough for that. So I mean, who else could it be? Yeah, I, I agree. Occam's Razor, in my opinion, says it's someone new. And no, absolutely, Occam's Razor. If somebody right, could get I'm... to the top under their under their main, presumably they would have. <laughs> Seriously, but I mean, I'm also fascinated by like, you know, did someone really get to, you know, they could be lurking on the Discord. I, I would not be horrifically surprised if they just have a different Discord name and just never interact. Mm -hmm. You know, there's just so many new names in the introduction channel that, you know, I, I keep an eye on it, but I don't remember everyone. You know, and that definitely... Was kind of it was kind of difficult for me to find the Discord. It, it was relatively easy to find the Plaid Hat Games Discord, and uh, it wasn't until like a little bit later I kept digging, and then I eventually did find this the the, the real Discord. Did you land the Summoner's War first? Oh yeah, <laughs> that uh, that makes searching uh, difficult every time I'm I'm looking for something. Oh my gosh! So how did you actually find this Discord, the real one? I'm curious now, like, how like how do people succeed? I can't remember where I found it. it I might have seen somebody say something about it in the Plaid Hat Discord. Uh, I don't remember. It, it you know, took a, a few minutes to realize this was, isn't the Summoner Wars community chat that I was sort of hoping for in the Plaid Hat Games one. I didn't even know there was a Plaid Hat Games one, and I do not remember how I found found this one. And I do think I would guess that there's some opportunity for Plaid Hat to um, probably be a little bit more optimized from a marketing perspective. But um, you know, to the point Fuzzy you made earlier about Joe being a solo developer, and then um, uh, oh, who is it that's the community manager whose name I've forgotten? Nick. Yeah, Nikki. Um, she. Um, like for her, like she's she, again, she's a solo, solo, solo act, right? So it, it's got to be challenging for them. But I do think that they probably, if they crowdsourced on the Discord, hey, you know, what are some things that we should be doing to amplify the Summoner Wars message? Um, I think there's probably 
I think they'd get some pretty interesting insights would be my guess. I agree fully, and I also acknowledge that it's a lot for someone like Nick to just comb through every single message that comes through. 100%. You know, yeah, it needs I, to be I, more, more targeted. Like, they, they need to explicitly ask questions, and, and maybe they do some of that in the playtesting channel, too. I'm not certain. It's one of the things that I've always wanted more of is just a more focused channel of communication between the community that you know produces all this great content and you know plaid hat games like you know how do we do this you know like let's solve a problem together how do we make the discord more visible you know do we go on a blitz on reddit like all these other sort of sub groups that you think would be the summoner community with summoner wars community and kind of aren't like there's the reddit group there's board game geek and I also know that there's sometimes confusion when Joe posts on the plaid hat, um, like the designer section of Board Game Geek, rather than like the Summoner Wars forums. But I definitely remember looking at the Reddit group, looking at Board Game Geek, kind of finding it to be mostly, mostly dead, and then finally kind of giving up and going like, fine, I'll try the Discord. <laughs> You know, I don't even know what I had against the Discord. I think it was just this general vibe of, like, you know... I, 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 yeah, I, it's, hard to, it's hard to describe now. I just have this mentality of, like, gamers are, you know, kind of just... Not all gamers are toxic, but that there's enough toxicity that I can't be bothered. And I think because we're a small community... Yeah, you know, it it just it it doesn't come up the same way. It's people who know each other rather than people on the freeway. You know, you're mean to people on the freeway in a way that you're just not mean to people who live on your street. And I think just the fact that we're small means there's much more of a people on your street vibe to, you know, to Discord interactions. You know, even when we're just like arguing for like you know 20 years about whether hans one is you know, a real person or an alt you know like there's you know there's no malice to it you know there's no there's no like arguing with strangers to it you know, we all just want to know who this person is and i will be impressed if they got this good without really like the summoner wars community resources at all like without reading the guides on sw zone or you know any of the new content that people are producing now i i would be very curious if someone really gets that good just by playing because well, they're, they're, i definitely wouldn't have they are specializing in some of the factions that i i think in by specializing are are really good right like they've been playing a lot of crimson order and fungal dwarves and actually i think those are the only two i've seen i've played against them <laughs> on but i think i think that helps picking those factions helps fungal dwarves isn't i don't know that i would have necessarily figured it out without the discord no uh, like i don't know that i would have figured out their shtick i think i lost but... my first eight games i played with them <laughs> It's weird. They're the ones that everyone is kind of conscientious about telling newcomers, hey, these guys are tough. You know, these guys have this weird shtick. They're hard to figure out. Maybe you want to start with a different faction. My experience with Fungal Dwarves is actually they're maybe the reason that I participated in the Discord. You know, because I definitely lurked. You know, I definitely read enough of what Aaron was writing about them that even as a new player that wasn't very good at Summoner Wars, like, in general, you know, I figured out Fungal Dwarves. Like, I figured out their shtick. Like, that was kind of the only thing I knew how to do well, but I figured out the, little, the life cycle of beasts and carriers. And I definitely remember being a much more active contributor to these strats conversations when I was much newer than I would have ever contributed for any of the other factions. Like, I wouldn't have told anyone how to play 
um, you know, polar dwarves or something, because the community had so much more time playing polar dwarves. But fungal dwarves was weird enough and new enough and specific enough that, you know, I was willing to, like, you know, debate with Aaron and play games with Aaron, even though, you know, I wasn't anywhere near his level at the time. Um, but that said, I don't know if I would have, I, I don't know if I would have figured it out without like the social interaction. Like, I don't know if I would have just been handed the cards and just had any idea what to do with them. So that's why I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious, you know, people learn in different ways and definitely my way really depended on getting on the discord and asking questions and talking to people. I don't, I don't think I would have learned by just playing and only watching what my opponent does on the app. I mean, what about you guys? Like, how did, you know, what's, what, what eases the learning curve for all of you? Like all, all three of you, I want to hear about this. Well, you know, first three or four months for me, I was just playing against friends, uh, like two friends who the one who got me into the game and another one that I got into the game. And we basically, just, whatever uh, decks we had access to, we would rotate through them and not play the same one twice. Uh, and one of my friends is uh, much better at the game than me. I think I'm like, uh, I win maybe one out of 10 games against him. So I just, whenever we'd always have at least one game going at a time. And when one ended, whoever won would send an invite link to the other person for the next game uh, and just go rotate through all the decks, focus on a couple that. Uh, we're more attractive. You didn't play that much open queue. You just kind of played with each other. Yeah, I didn't play any uh, open queue for for months, and then eventually I was like, "Yeah, I, I could probably have more than just two games going on at once." Man, let me, <laughs> let me try one in the public queue. The I don't know how the people who play ten games at once do it. I I really. <laughs> If I have more than four, then my gameplay really suffers. You know, even now. Yeah, like, same. No, yeah, so same. no, so so what what about you, um, Ben and Fizka? And I know I feel like you've both been around forever because you've been around longer than me. But just just <laughs> learning curves through the game. Like, what's your style? Do you read guides? Do you need to just play? Do you need to argue with people on the Discord? I mean, for me, it's uh, the re re I do read the guides. Usually, I'll take a couple of key insights out of the guides that will be super helpful. So, like, you know, the fungal dwarves always try to keep three magic as an example. Um, you know, th things like that. Um, honestly, I think the biggest way I learn is um, by seeing surprising plays that I didn't think were possible. <laughs> yes. And one of the things that I've been um, idly thinking about is that a useful resource, in addition to the guides, would be a faction by faction list of their tricks. Um, you know, what are the you know what are the most important tricks? And so I've been kicking around starting to put something together along those lines because mm -hmm. that is really the biggest thing that I learned. And it's one of the problems with the number of new factions because I felt like the first I don't know dozen factions I know well enough that I know literally all of their tricks and that's just stopped being possible um, yeah. with everything new that gets released. And so it's like, I was playing a game against the Crimson Order the other day and I'm like, oh, I'm doing great. And then Sekhmet came out and I'm like, oh, right, they have a unit that flies. <laughs> well, yeah. So that, that's been my experience. I'll say this, and I, I, I actually felt like this game was pretty darn accessible because... I could queue up an open, you know, I could queue up a game. I'd figure out who my random opponent was. And even if they picked a deck that I didn't know, it's not, it was never that much load to hop onto swzone.com and just do a one time read through all the cards and then go back to this open queue game and take my first turn. Like, I always felt like that was a manageable amount of cards to read and ingest for one game. But I did definitely remember sometimes queuing up games and then I'd get something, you know, you know, like, like Fallen Kingdom or something where 
you just have to relearn how to play the game for the sake of playing against Fallen Kingdom. And I definitely remember there were times where it's like, I do not feel like going to SW Zone and reading through all the cards. And I mean, you can read through all the cards on the app. It doesn't really matter where you read through all the card text. But I just remember some, it never felt unmanageable to do so. But I remember definitely sometimes early on, I was just not in the mood. Like, I'm not in the mood to learn an opponent deck. I just want to play. And I've always been curious what people's takes on that are. I know, like, I think... You know, there are people I've had conversations about this on Discord, you know, like shampoos on record on just being like, this is an accessibility problem. Like, my wife couldn't be bothered to learn all the cards, and I started destroying her. Um, but I don't know. I've never found one deck at a time to be bad. But now that there's so many more decks, you know, I kind of wonder if you just burn out having to learn a new opponent deck every single time you queue up with someone. And, you know, maybe, um, you know, who is Judy, someone like who is Judy Devlin Fish is in a better position to answer that. Um, but, you know, it always just interests me just, you know, like, like how, you know, how do you learn the opponent decks? Does everyone read through the decks like I do? Do, 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 do you, any of you just, if you remember when the decks were new, just play it. Like, just, I have no idea what's coming. I'm just going to play this game because I don't feel like doing any homework. I, I do. When, when the new decks come out, that's how I play. I'll, I'll wait probably two weeks, not play any of the new decks, just like play my normal decks, occasionally get matched up against the new decks and just be like, oh, that's cool. Oh, that's cool. And then I'll try playing the new decks a few times. And then usually, like usually the season a set of new decks come out, I don't play them very much at all. I play them probably three or four times just to make sure I've got familiarity playing them from the player side. And then usually in any given season, I'll try to focus on a set of decks that I want to learn or get better at. Um, and then the next season, I'll pick a new set of decks. Because I find if I splash it around all the different decks, I just, I actually get confused and don't have as much fun as when I'm, you know, really trying to focus on, you know, how do you win with the avians or, or that type of thing. Progression. I mean, just starting, start from any random, I mean, I'm just curious, like, you know, you know, like the, the last few decks, like, which, what's been the progression of what you focused on from like, you know, say one league season to the next? Uh, this is, I mean, this season, I'm not doing anything that's new. Um, I'm actually, I, I almost always end up playing Cave Goblins and Wayfarers because, you know, top tier. Also, I just love playing them. Um, Agreed. This, this season, I've been adding the Avians and the Tundra Orcs. Um, so those are my four. Also, the four that I took into the tournament. Last season, I really pushed on um, Shadow Elves and High Elves. Um, I'm still not great with the Shadow Elves, but I at least know them well enough to stop getting stomped every time I play somebody with the Shadow Elves. So that's good. And High Elves, I really enjoyed, although I was definitely playing them suboptimally because I would play Valeria as like a char the same way I play the goblins and that works sometimes and it's really really fun with her when it works but it is not in my in my view the optimal play it's just I, I tend to like factions where I can do that with yeah I agree with you that it is really fun to play high elves that way and I think it's recognizable enough when you can that I don't you know, I, I wouldn't, I don't know, at least for me, I don't necessarily dismiss it as, as suboptimal. I just sort of recognize that I can do this sometimes, but not others. But I have definitely found from doing these scuffles that even though Prophet is clearly a better High Elves player than me, I play quite a bit worse when I try to play like Prophet. Mm -hmm. rather than just playing my own game mm -hmm. yeah, i think high sure. elves is the one faction where actually doing the scuffles and listening to the effort to the experts has kind of made my own game worse not because the mm -hmm. advice is bad but because i kind of do better playing as myself rather than trying to play like profit you know, it's just it's just funny that way. And that's, you know, and I think that just speaks to what clicks for individual personalities. Like, I still want to learn the Prophet High Elves game, 
but I kind of recognize that, you know, it might be a little bit of getting worse before I get better. And sometimes I just want to play myself. <laughs> you know, like if, if I reach a local, you know, a local maxima, then so be it. Yeah, I, f- I feel like that's a lot of my approach to Summoner Wars is like, I just stubbornly want to do it myself. Like I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to read a guide that tells me how to do it or I'm fine reading a guide, but only after I've played the faction like 20 times myself, um, to like, to, to get a sense for it. Like, I feel like I, I had a similar experience, like watching a donkey and orange lads video where donkey or their orange lads said about donkey playing Savannah elves. Like, Oh yeah, he'll just sit back and like accumulate the God hand. So I know I have to like go at him. And then I was like, oh, I guess I'll just play Savannah Elves and just sit back and then I'll just win. And then that just didn't happen. <laughs> and it's just like, <laughs> it's like, I, like, I don't know which cards to keep. Like, it's like the chant of entangling. Like, I'm just I'm just sitting back and not getting any tempo and I'm holding all these cards. And um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's always it's always just more enjoyable for me to f- figure it out myself. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm curious to ask Shrek, what what your experience is with with factions? Yeah, uh, your uh, so, so someone else, uh, physics, fisk, <laughs> what went yeah. through? Like, what which which factions you started with, and which are your favorites? Yeah, I, I feel like I I zoomed in on the Avians pretty early. Uh, I I do like uh, the Goblins a good bit as well. I think of other than the, a couple decks like that, I think of myself as mostly just dabbling in lots of decks and uh i just started doing league recently and uh part of my strategy there is to give myself permission to be bad in league and have that be a thing to force me to try new decks that i don't i don't uh, play with a ton otherwise so uh, oh my gosh i'm just gonna like signal boost that is like for anyone on the fence just play league and give yourself permission to be bad like I got so stressed out when I joined League. Like, what if I suck? What if I suck? And like, not worth it. Like, not worth. I the think stress. probably like, <laughs> probably like a full quarter of the League games that I played so far. My League game is the first time I've ever played that faction. Nice. I I I kind of I was too anal retentive to ever like really go in cold like that. Like I from like early on would just be like someone, you know, does anyone want to practice the matchup, <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, I, I do feel like that's another thing I encourage because, you know, that's how you make friends. But I definitely like, recognize in hindsight that there's players that are just much more willing to be like, cool, league, first time playing this faction, I'm just going to wing it. <laughs> and well, funny, I, would, I would always be like, no, I need to practice. Like I, I need to read the opponent's deck and I need to practice. I think when we played in league, I don't know if we, whenever the uh, Swamp Orcs came out um, and we were playing Swamp, I forget what the Swamp, it was Swamp Orcs matchup. I forget who it was playing against, but you and I were playing. That was the first time I'd played Swamp Orcs. And I actually <laughs> still remember you making a comment afterwards about how weird they are to play because it's like you have to keep, you have to keep protecting these little gas stations that you're refilling from, which yes. was a really awesome some insight that I absolutely have kept in my head in terms of how I think about it. <laughs> oh my gosh, I think I went off on the Discord about that too. And, and I actually, I remember my take on it was at the time, like, why is it fun to have to protect these weak little gas stations? <laughs> and my answer now is it just is. It just is really fun <laughs> to grow the swamp. It's because Mudlug can throw like a million dice if you do it right. That's why it's fun. Exactly. Yeah. But I, I've somehow stopped resenting like the whole little weak little gas stations thing. <laughs> like, like I, I, I just hate. I, I, Swamp Orcs is probably one of my favorites right now. And I couldn't tell you why. I don't even necessarily think, think it fits my play style. Like, there's just something satisfying about having Muglug throw a million dice. And I think there's something possibly one-dimensional, but definitely not easy about keeping the swamp protected. You know, you know, deciding, you know, do I want to attack with this bog shaman, even though it's only two range, because I need something going on other than Muglug. 
you know, you know, because I think hiding stuff behind gates and not getting your three attacks in is an easy way to die a slow death. Um, I don't know. I just, I just like swamp works. I don't, I don't think I, I, I you get just that. enough trickiness with the vine pole too. Yeah, yeah. Yes. No, definitely vine mancers are one of the biggest reasons swamp works is fun. Like, it's not just chuck a million dice. It's how clever you can be with the blind orcs. And I love that they can only, they can only pull. Like, it's just, it just makes the spatial puzzle that much better somehow. Yeah. You know, I think I still, like, the, like, just the sort of sometimes it is the restriction that inspires you to be creative. You know, so they're I, the first... Go on. I hate any of the factions that have a high level of spatial uh, logic associated with them, which I know sounds weird given how much I like the cave goblins and the avians, but I find them a lot more linear than um, the swamp orcs. I have I, I have this thing where I basically just don't have a mind's eye. Like, I can't picture future states. So I end up, like, the amount of undoing I end up doing when I'm playing uh, games and tournaments and stuff like that is crazy. And Swamp Orcs, the spatial piece, just like, all right, I got to have my Dredger here and I got to have my Vine Mancer here. And I got, no, just no, I do not like. Interesting. I do like, I like Fungal Dwarves, High Elves, and Swamp Orcs because I like that you know, basically solving the Kuldak diamond every turn. <laughs> like, for whatever reason, that just... You know, it just, I don't even have a good reason why I find that enjoyable. I don't have a good reason why I find Summoner Wars enjoyable. It is just a game. But definitely yeah. these sort of... The factions where they affect each other's positioning kind of scratches a particular itch. Whereas I have trouble with the Reachy factions. Like, you know, I, I love Wayfarers. I think they're maybe the faction that I love the most relative to how good I'm at, I, how good or not I actually am at them. Like, I enjoy them out of proportion to, you know, to actually being good. But definitely the ones where they have a lot of reach like the wayfarers, cave goblins, and especially avians, you know, I feel like I can calculate where they can go, but I don't really necessarily know whether that's a good move, whether they should go there. You know, I kind of see all the possibilities, but I don't know which of the possibilities is a good one, and then my head explodes and I have to go do something else. Uh, yeah. One of the reasons I enjoy those factions more so than Swamp Orcs is because there isn't a lot of setup. Like I find them more reactive. You're you're usually in any given turn looking at the board state, what you've got in your hand, and and reacting. I don't tend to find when I play them at least that I'm trying to set things up two or three turns in advance. Whereas for something like swamp orcs or fungal dwarves, it's a lot more about like gate placement, which is an example of where gate placement strategy is something that I literally never think about just doesn't occur to me not something i focus on at all and so you know fungal dwarves high elves where you want to think about like where is my peace arbiter of peace relative to my arbiter of justice it's just anything that's planning more than that turn um i find very challenging and so like end game matches i actually probably have a 30 percent win rate for anything that gets down to like me versus the opponent summoner when we're hunting each other down because I just am so poor at the long-term spatial logic of the game. So for anybody who wants to know how to beat me, outlast me, and then I'll probably lose in the end game. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it makes me want to ask, and maybe this will be the last question since so we should wrap things up soon, but like, what draws each of you to your favorite faction? So for this good, the the cave goblins or or, or 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 others if you want to and, and test strike the avians um like what 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 do you what do you feel makes something your favorite or like the the play style that you want to do i think i'm attracted to anything that looks super aggressive on the surface i i love super aggressive play uh when i played chess that was the way i played chess too super aggressive and then and then playing that faction 
uh, and enjoying that part of it. Eventually, I learned how to actually be good at it, which, you know, someone who thankfully has all these other little tricks and nuances to the deck. Um, I, that's probably my main, my main progression. Yeah, it's the same for me. I, I, <laughs> my default anytime I'm playing a new faction is to play it aggressively. And, I mean, I mentioned the four factions I'm playing this season are Cave Goblins, Wayfarers, Tundra Orcs, and uh, Avians. And I know that for the Tundra... I've learned that for the Tundra Orcs and Avians, like, a lot... There's a lot more defensive play in it. Because, obviously, Tundra Orcs, I think everyone has the experience of... Grog deck has a lot of health! Charge! <laughs> um, I did that so many games. So, I, I've actually... It, it takes a lot of self-control with both the Avians and the Tundra Orcs to, to hold back. But Cave Goblins and Wayfarers, like, I do just love the overwhelming aggression, tempo, drop your whole hand... Um, you know, with the Wayfarers, oh, I've got Bulldo in the first hand. Oh, well, bye. You know, it's just, it's, uh, it's, I, that's definitely what I enjoy about it. How about you, Ben? Uh, it's something. <laughs> I, 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 what draws you to your favorite factions? Uh, I, I, I think, I think the econ game, like, I, I think the value game, I think, like i don't know just just feel just feeling like i'm slowly like trading slightly more efficiently than my opponent and that i'll come out on top um and that can <laughs> that can work with aggressiveness too because like when i'm playing wayfarers it's like oh it's super fun to just charge forward but i also know that like blocking my opponent's gates um it's like just putting them in a really tough position to trade efficiently and so like I would also come, like, I'm going to kill them, but I would also kill them in the econ. <laughs> or something. Yes. Um, <laughs> you keep uh, saying that over and over on the Discord. That's, like, my pet thing to argue about. Is <laughs> that, like, no, I mean, spatial positioning, spatial aggro is not the same as econ aggro, and they're not, like, mm -hmm. correlated, inversely correlated. I mean, they're sort of correlated, but it's not, it's not the same thing at all. You know, you can charge forward and be econ efficient. You know, or hang back and be kind of efficient. But I'm curious, Ben, like, were you always a value player or did you have your standard arc of coming in like, cool, I'm going to like charge up field and like hack and slash and be aggro. I feel like that's how everyone starts with like Tundra Orcs versus Phoenix Elves is just like <laughs> charge, attack. You know, or did you start that way or were you always like, I'm going to be this crafty, tr you know, crafty about trading units? Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I was never, I was never an assassin player. I, and I, my, my, the first faction that I was like, oh, I love this was Rhett Talus. So, and like, mm. th th there's something about, something about combo decks. And I think a lot of people say in just like, just any game, it's like, oh, this card combos with this card, which combos with this card and doing some, uh, some big explosion. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like I was sort of lucky with like playing in person summoner wars for a lot of the beginning that against people of my own skill level i feel like a lot of games just sort of went to the late game um i i don't know and so i, I just got used to that idea that like like that, that 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 that's what i'm that that's what i'm playing for that like oh I, I could do some early damage to the summoner but they're probably gonna find a way to retreat um and um i don't know it, but like but putting it out loud like i was never i was never thinking it about that and like at this point i kind of joke about myself as an econ player but like it wasn't mm -hmm. until like over a year in that i kind of like acknowledged that but i don't know um just that was just Please, playing. <laughs> John, I was what's the name of that that archetype in the of the magic players is that the the Johnny player, the one who's always trying yes. to get their their combo to go off. Yeah, <laughs> I've always wondered if you could come up with a summoner roars quiz, and it doesn't have to be like fancy, but actually just reason you know some even reasonably like do you consider yourself an aggro player, and you know reasonably assign someone a faction that they're more likely to enjoy than a random faction. You know, even if it's like three questions about, you know, like, you know, do you know, do you, what magic archetype do you consider yourself? Or, you know, are you to me a Johnny or a Spike or, you know, 
you know, do you like play aggro or playing for value? I mean, just, I, I don't know what the questions would be, but I've always wondered if that, if you could come up with that and just sort of match make people with the factions that they're going to like and learn the game with and just enjoy right out of the gate, as opposed to say bouncing because you got obsidian dwarves and you're just not comfortable with that <laughs> style of play. Well, even if they, who is it that did those, uh, who does those um, cards with the the rankings of the factions in terms of like aggression and reach oh, yeah, and things like that? Infernal S, yeah. Yeah, I mean, even if those were, you know, if when you're, when you sign up for the first time, you get to see those and you pick a faction instead of getting one at random, that would be a, a big upgrade. Right. Yeah. But I'm not even like make you read through that card through like you know a dozen decks you know i'm just thinking like three questions could probably just hone in on mm -hmm. you know do you want to charge up field or do you want to hang back in a nice fortress you yeah. know like that's my question really like could a three question quiz accomplish the same amount of matchmaking at, with a faction as like reading through all those cards that colonel s did which is which are great by the way you know, they were inspired by Spirit Island, and I just really, I wish Plaid Hat would make them official somehow. You know, I think they would help new players a lot. But we you could all... probably do, do pretty well, like, just, like, listing the three Magic player archetypes. Be like, which one of these is closest to you? And then be like, okay, here's a list of, of uh, five factions. Pick the one that uh, you like the theme of the most. Oh, dude. Yeah. Well, first of all, you don't assume everyone knows their magic archetype. But no, also, no, you, you'd anyone, have to. Does anyone admit to being a Timmy? Like, does <laughs> anyone admit, like, I just like big creatures and flashy effects, <laughs> I mean, and I have no idea how to value cards? Like, does anyone I mean, admit? I, I really sound like a I have a couple decks like that. <laughs> Some days I wake up, and that's the deck I want to play. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one thing I will criticize about Summoner Wars is I wish champions were better costed because my inner, you know, my inner Timmy wants to summon big champions that do big things. And I think there are too, just like a couple too many champs in the game that kind of aren't worth it, you know, unless you're winning anyway and are just going to summon, you know, the most, you know, just summon everything. But I, I do, I, I do wish champions were better costed, so my inner Timmy would be happier. You like spatial and big champions. Now I understand why you like the fungal dwarves so much. You want to get the diamond and monstrosity out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I actually haven't played that much fungal dwarves since like the very beginning. Like I remember having a moment of. I actually remember specifically this was before ranked play, and I was still a pretty new player, but. I think I won like 10 games in a row with fungal dwarves at a time when people were complaining on the discord about how they hated queuing up and facing <laughs> fungal dwarves. And I, I remember kind of feeling like enough of a jerk that I was like, yeah, okay, fine. I'll go play something else. <laughs> but then like, I never, I never got good at them again. Like I never pressed my early advantage and turned it into, you know, becoming Aaron 2.0 with them. You know, I sort of got distracted and just like went off elsewhere. Never really, you know, never specialized the way, I, you know, maybe I could have, but maybe I wouldn't have gained kind of base level summoner war skills. I don't, I, I feel like fungal dwarves were actually easy once you got their shtick because they're melee, melee odds are pretty easy to calculate. You know, they don't have a lot of movement tricks going on. So I probably could have stayed a fungal dwarf you know specialist for a while but i really wouldn't have you know kind of figured out summoner wars 101 you know i wouldn't have figured out kind of the bread and butter of you know three moves three attacks odds calculations where do i place my gates so i'm kind of glad i didn't specialize in fungal dwarves but yeah if, if you give me like the I don't know. I, I, I don't disagree with like spatial positioning and big creatures give me like monstrosity and pullback. <laughs> I don't disagree with that at all at all. And I do th I, I do like the theme. I, I love the the sort of the off fantasy the, 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 the factions that don't correspond to kind of tired fantasy archetypes. You know, I love that this fungal colony was something that I'd never seen before and 
you know, it just had this horror gross out element to it that wasn't as gross as the filth, which by the way, I just personally found too gross, like too upsetting. But and Fungal Dwarves pushes that button perfectly. As a chemist, I am so looking forward to Deepwood Grokes. Um, I just, I, I absolutely am going to try to try to learn them well because I am. That's just that's a that's such a cool concept. Oh my gosh, I love that. You know, like just, and it's funny. Like I remember for a while, like people from first edition were kind of like, you know, when's Prong going to get his own faction? When is Turt going to get his own faction? Like. <laughs> Like I, I, I'm so happy for the frog faction. That yeah. like, just frogs and potions. I don't know. Like I don't, I don't know that I necessarily. You know, I'm kind of like you know, my husband's a mechanical engineer. I'm a software engineer. Like we do engineering things, but I don't necessarily think I need. Um, um, what's his face? Cogs, frogs, and cogs. Oh, yeah. What is the cogs? Why the inventor and forged. Yeah, I don't really need the forge just because, like, that's my job. <laughs> I don't know. I'd, I'd almost want the potions more because I'm not a chemist and I don't, you know, don't think about potions in my day to day and like, I can daydream whatever potions I want. Or I, I don't need to adhere to science <laughs> to. You know, to think about potions, <laughs> but I am look. I I am really looking forward to both those new factions. Like they're just fun and different thematically. The art in the spoilers channel looks amazing. It really does. Yeah. But with that, we should probably wrap things up here. Um. Uh yeah th th <laughs> thank you guys uh, you, you guys signed up for a game and we roped you into a podcast uh but thank you so much for <laughs> coming on i hope you enjoyed it uh gosh, yeah, man, i think that's oh go on go on no i just absolutely enjoyed it this was uh this was a ton of fun and uh thanks for the the work that you two do uh, again creating uh content for the community i think this stuff's really cool thank you thanks. thank you yeah and, and Thanks so much for coming on. Uh, this this was <laughs> great, great to great to chat about, and great to see the game. No, oh, thank you guys. Like I, I learned so much from these. You know? Awesome. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Well, obvious. I will see you guys later. Take care. All right. See you on the internet. <laughs> <Bye>. <laughs> yeah.